Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us for the third webinar on the freshly updated small scale community solar guide. Um, my name's Tom Knockholds, um, and we're being joined this week by Heather Smith. Say hello, Heather. And, hello, everyone. Uh, and Chris Weir. Hi, everybody. So it's going to be a change of format from the last two webinars. We're going to be um, we're going to be uh, stepping into an explanation of what these two real world projects have actually done with their donation based models for small scale community solar. Um, so hopefully it's a little bit more dynamic and uh, and we get a lot of value out of hearing firsthand the stories uh, the stories from from these groups. So. Uh, Right. So I'm just going to quickly run through the background. Uh, apologies, those of you that have already seen this a couple of times, but I'll, I'll run through it a, a little bit quicker than I have before. Just so you know, we're, we've recorded previous webinars. So if you want to see the introduction or you want to see the introduction to the um, common legal framework section of the document, please, um, please go to c4ce.net.au and you'll find that information there. Sorry, that's confusing. There was a different URL on the screen. Um, c4ce.net.au, follow the links and you'll find the, the recordings of all the webinars um, on, on that website. So why are we here? Well, uh, back in 2015, as part of the National Community Energy Strategy, which was developed by the Coalition for Community Energy, um, there was a part of that, which was Appendix E, that was a guide to small scale community solar. That whole project was funded by ARENA. The lead author was the Institute for Sustainable Futures at, at the University of Technology in Sydney. And there were a bunch of collaborators, particularly the first five models that contributed their case studies. Because uh, at the time, they were, they were the, the, the main models that were up and running. It's amazing to see how much things have come, come along in the last five years, uh, three, four years. Um, we, we've got a lot more groups that have succeeded in getting successful models across the line. Um, so why have we updated the guide? Um, there's several key reasons. There's, there's, there's been new case studies, um, in particular in sort of late 2016, Pingala and Lismore decided to write case studies with the specific intention of inserting them into the guide. Um, and at that time, um, the, the decision tree, this is a really nice visual graphic that now sits at the back of the guide, um, was, was updated by, by Brendan, Brendan Lim. Um, who donated his time to do that. What we found and noticed at the Community Energy Congress in February was that there was actually a lack of awareness about the existence of the guide. Kind of no surprise because the guide was, after all, Appendix E, um, and that gives you an idea of how much it was eclipsed by the bigger body of work um, at that time. Uh, also at the Congress, there was a strong theme of partnerships, and one of the... One of the um, strategies that the Coalition for Community Energy wanted to deploy was to create these quick win strategic initiatives. So we sought funding um, and, uh, and we're really lucky that the Victorian government through Sustainability Victoria provided funds to update this document. It's now been released as a standalone document. Um, Community Power Agency were the lead author, but again, it was highly collaborative. All of, the, um, all of the case studies uh, were, pretty much all of the case studies were updated. Um, and we've added five new case studies, doubling the number of case studies in the document. We've added a whole new section, the legal, common legal structures I mentioned earlier. Um, and um, yeah, we're really excited about this, this, this update. So we need, we, uh, we're really pleased to have support of Sustainability Victoria and we're just going to quickly play this video. I, I just need to stop sharing for a second and then restart this. So apologies for the technology. Okay, sorry about that. Here you go, Carl. Welcome to the Small Scale Solar Guide webinar series taking place each Tuesday throughout the course of September. At Sustainability Victoria, we're passionate about making a sustainable and thriving Victoria, mobilising us all to create a better environment now and for our future. 
We're proud to have supported the Community Power Agency bringing you this webinar series and the latest edition of the Community Solar Guide. Over the four webinars, we'll get to hear some really innovative ideas for behind the meter investment and some great legal frameworks. I hope you enjoy the series. Thank you, Carl. That's great. So again, Com uh, Coalition for Community and the Energy uh, are, are, the, are the sort of owners and authors of this guide. So, final point to make is that um, we've released version two, but we intend to do a minor update in, in, the, in the coming weeks. So if you notice anything that's not right, if you wanna make any offers to, to contribute in a more substantial way to the guide, um, please email that email address, secretariat at c4ce.net.au. And we would, um, we would love, we'd love to incorporate your feedback into the, the, the version 2.1 of the guide. So, Donation models are one of the sort of three major pillars that exist within the guide, sitting alongside investment and multi-household models. And so tonight we're going to be diving fairly deep into two examples of those, of those looking at case studies in, in more detail. Simply put, donation models are raising funds which are donated by members of the public or perhaps philanthropic organisations. And for the purpose of definition, we include government grant funding into the, in this model as well. Um, it can include more modern methods or like, such as, such as um, crowdfunding using a web platform, or it can include some very um, traditional fundraising programs, simply going out into the community and shaking a bucket and raising the funds that way. This is a very popular and a very relatively easy way of getting projects up and running. Um, in the introduction webinar and in the beginning of the guide, we talk about what are the barriers that make it difficult to um, do small scale solar. And donation models sidestep all of the issues related to raising investment funds from members of the community. We're simply not having to do that with these models. And so they're a lot easier to manage, um, uh, to, to, to navigate the regulatory environment. So the three examples in the guide are, are Karina, uh, which was in the first version of the guide, and Heather's going to talk to us tonight about, about their model. Um, and we also have Macedon Rangers. They're not joining us tonight, um, but, but we're, we're really thrilled to have Chris Weir from Bendigo Sustainability Group, who is actually a bit of a is, has actually been part of a group that's been doing a multi-model approach, but starting with donation models. Um, so we'll, we'll hear here in detail the, the approach that those guys have been taking. Um, why donations? Well, I've just covered that off, so we'll move forward. Um, and I'm going to pass over now to Heather Smith. Um, Heather's one of the key volunteers at, at Carina, um, by no means the only volunteer. And I'll get you to introduce yourself, Heather, in terms of what it is that your background is and what it is you do for, for Carina. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I uh, have a background in industrial energy efficiency first, my first career. My second career was in climate change policy, energy policy, industry policy and in state government. And when I left state government, I managed to win myself a Churchill Fellowship and I got this wonderful opportunity to travel around the world looking at energy uh, transitions and community energy. And I was interested to see how community energy was pro helping provoke change. And um, obviously, if you're interested in any of that, I can talk forever, but uh, there's a lot on my blog and my website, so um, I, I can certainly share those uh, with people later. But to talk about Karina, um, now I should be able to just click here and start, uh, there we go, there's, there's Karina. So Karina's a, um, the brainchild of a wonderful woman called Margaret Hinder. And uh, this was dreamt up on the walk for solar from Port Augusta to uh, Adelaide, advocating for the solar thermal power station, which was announced just a month or so ago. So um, after a sort of five year campaign that has got over the line. And the, the initial thought was, if only everybody chipped in a little bit, we could have this thing. And people started chipping in, so we quickly developed a model to use that money well 
while we were still advocating for a million dollar, um, multi-million dollar uh, solar thermal power station. So if I get started here um, with my, not doing page down, you might need to do page down for me there. You might have control back now. It might be, it might be a bit slow. So um, to date, Karina has lent $232,000 to Quick Win Projects. We run a revolving fund, and I'll go through that in a minute about how that works. And we're a relatively small organisation. So out of our donors, a lot of them are regular donors. Uh, they chip in every week or every month. And sometimes uh, we have a lot of regular donors who just um, is, sit in wait for good projects and suddenly get excited and throw, throw a, a bit of money into a, into a good project. So it's a wonderful um, uh, initiative. We've got about 80 members and the membership fees help fund our admin and things like that. And they're very modest. It's something like $20 for an individual member. Um, we've done 17 quick win projects and I updated this slide last night and I had 14 quick win projects about a year ago, but, um, or six months ago, but I had 150 megawatt hours and it's already up to 300 megawatt hours, which starts to show the momentum that we're building with how we've, um, how we've gone ahead. And basically the, the quick win projects model so to just go back over the revolving fund model, for each $100 that was donated to the very first project, uh, which was the Tolganeen Disability Centre, that money has been repaid and relent 2.1 times. So you can see that the power of the revolving fund model. So I've got a picture of all the different um, uh, sorts of uh, facilities that we've funded on the next slide, which... Maybe it's page down that it wants me to do. I'm not quite sure. I'll move it forward um, for you. <laughs> there we go. And, and what we've driven, you know, solar has changed in its cost effectiveness over time. It's definitely getting cheaper. And it's always been worthwhile. We had a little bit of a hiccup in South Australia with demand charges coming in. Every time someone changed their meter, which happens with a solar installation, they got put on a different tariff, which would undermine the investment. So we've found that, um, driving for energy efficiency to be part of the project really helps give us a good project payback. And we uh, lend to not-for-profits at, at a no interest. Uh, so we work hard to make sure it pays itself off in a, a reasonable time frame, five to six years, and that those not-for-profits will make money from day one. So their savings will outweigh their outgoings to repay the loan to us. So that's really at the heart of why do it for not-for-profits, um, you know, because we're doing them quite a good deal here. And so partly that's what uh, appeals to our donors as well. You know, it's, it's a good news story. You're helping community houses, childcare centres, um, all sorts of good community groups who might have a uh, struggle to get the, the funding otherwise. Um, so on the next slide, she says, maybe it's, maybe it's the mouse I need to, to be using. We also have a big win uh, project fund and this was the one that was set up for the solar thermal project. Uh, and we're tending to run that as a revolving fund as well, but we do have more flexibility on that uh, fund. But interestingly, by splitting the two right at the beginning, that allowed people to donate to the things that they felt most uh, strongly about. And so we've gone back to our donors on the Big Win Project and asked them um, that, to see if they're okay about us trying some tenant landlord uh, experiments. So we're trying to break down that barrier between tenants and landlords to do with putting solar on houses. And the big driver behind Carina is reducing emissions. So that's why energy efficiency and solar are the main game here in terms of what we're trying to, to get. So I'll move off Big Win and get back to um, Quick Win projects here. Uh, this is a picture of the revolving fund. So as you can imagine, the, um, as one project pays itself off, that money helps contribute to the project that's waiting for a loan. And when 
we first uh, get a project application, it goes up on our website and we ask for more donations. So we're forever pouring donation money into our revolving fund, but the repayments from former projects really speeds up um, the, the amount that we can uh, lend and how fast we can lend. And we have looked at crowdfunding on other crowdfunding sites. There's generally a couple of solar projects floating around somewhere. And often they have a $10,000 goal, but they, they sort of grind to a halt after the initial fundraising. And so we see with the quick win model that that's speeding up and keeping, keeping people enthused about the project. Tom, I don't think my pressing... Right. That Just do. tell me and I'll move slides. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, and this really reinforces what was happening. Obviously, for Project 1, we had no... Um, a revolving fund at that stage. So we had to fundraise every single penny and it took quite a long time. It took something like six months. But as we came to Project 2, Project 3, things started to speed up. And you can see Project 12 there is almost half repayments and half newly donated funds. So that's really sped things up. I'll go to the next slide. Thanks, Tom. And this is what it looks like on our website. So we have a um, we have made the choice not to uh, let any leakage. We don't don't discourage. We don't encourage PayPal, but we we do have a PayPal facility. Uh, but we offer for people to um, pay straight uh, a direct transfer, and we have set up the crowdfunding thermometer and things like that because we're not we made the decision not to pay organizations like start some good or chuffed uh, to do the fundraising on their sites especially because part of what's causing our funds to flow is from our own money um, coming back as uh, repayments so if we move to the next one um, this is a bit of a, this sort of starts to highlight the momentum that we've gained with a revolving fund. We, um, it, it took us a couple of years to get those first couple of projects funded, but then in the last uh, three, year, uh, three years, we've funded five projects in 2015, seven projects in 2016, and 2017 looks like it's going to be a, a record year for us. We are struggling more with the project pipeline than we are with the funding. Because for us, it doesn't matter if it takes uh, three months to fund a project. It's really taking about six weeks at the moment. Um, but to actually have enough projects coming in to our pipeline is a challenge. Because some projects get started as an idea, but then there's still quite a lot of work to do to get it to a point where the committee board or committee of the organisation agree and we've checked it technically and things like that. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that um, we've, we're a national organisation. We've funded projects all the way around the country and our members are all the way around the country as well. And we've relied on our members to bring projects into us, but we are starting to advertise more widely. I think a couple of years ago, we were worried about having a rush on this no interest funding, but uh, the reality is we do need to reach out to more organisations and, um, and get the word out there that we've got the, this capability. And I'd like to say we were also seeing other um, people in this space. So we've worked with some projects that have ultimately gone off and get, got grant funding from PowerShop, for example. And so we've done a, all this hard work for a month and then not had a project to show for it because grant funding is more attractive. But what we've found is um, groups like Taztex in, um, in Tasmania have uh, been able to match both the idea of a grant, so they did some of their own fundraising, with having us available to do the top-up loan. And that worked really well for them. They couldn't raise the full $10,000 or whatever it was for their project, but they could raise 5,000 themselves and it worked really well to have um, us there to get their project over the line. So that's been great that we've been able to be a bit more flexible uh, with how we work with groups um, and, and get projects happening. Because at the end of the day, 
that's what we want to see is um, reduced CO2 emissions and lots of projects happening around the place. So if we move on to the next one, this is our, uh, our flow chart, if you like, and, and you'll see this if you do a, an application for a quick win project. So we have a bit of um, self-culling questions, making sure that the people that come in in the first instance are the sorts of people we want to support, not for profits, providing good um, things in their community. And we've had a few um, tricky times with, oh, if you're going to put solar on the roof, uh, there's a whole roof upgrade needed. And, and so sometimes these projects trigger more investment than we can really justify. Uh, so we've got a few questions in there about how good their electrics are and how, and how good their roof is and whether they actually own the building themselves. Um, and getting to the heart of who's going to sign off on the loan. So if we jump to what the legal arrangement is, at the end of the day, even though we do some work with the organisation to uh, provide technical advice, so we won't loan money to a project that we don't think is good enough in terms of um, tier one or tier two solar panels and uh, you know good quality LED lights if we're, if we're doing a lighting upgrade at the same time, those sorts of things. So we put a bit of a technical um, watch over, over the project proposal and we do try to help um, uh, groups. We actually get a, a discounted rate on LG panels. So if someone comes to us with a quote for LG panels, we go back to their installer and say, would this rate work better? And would you be able to give our community organisation a better deal? So we, we, it's a bit of a mixed bag into, in terms of how much the community group put together the project and how much we help them. And also um, how the, who they use as their installer. And, we, we have suggested installers in the past and we have pushed um, extra quotes on people if we don't think the prices are, are well enough. And uh, we go right back to the group early on in the process and say, this is our loan agreement. We need from you, in principle, agreement that you would be happy to sign it. So we get the legals um, looked at by the board from day one and then after, and it can take months, and I have one project that's been going for over a year now, um, once we finally get the project proposal in place, that goes back to the board in terms of how much it costs, what's the repayment going to repayment schedule going to be, um, and what it's going to look like in the loan agreement. And we don't sign the loan agreement at that stage, we put it on the website for funding at that stage. And it's only after the, the project's been funded that we sign the loan agreement and sign a cheque and tell them to get started. And that process right at the end seems to happen very quickly nowadays. As I said, uh, supported by the fact that we have a revolving fund. We've also, we, we think revolving funds are great. So we've um, helped uh, uh, groups like Quorum, which is Community Owned Renewable Energy Malamimbi, to get their own revolving fund up and running. Um, we, we helped them with our loan agreement, sharing our loan agreement and things like that so they could copy our model. And we've also, um, I think, funded one of, part funded one of their projects to get it started. So they see the value in the longer term of having a revolving fund that operates just in their community and can help to build um, their projects. So if we go to the, um, I've just got the last slide, I think, uh, Tom. There we go. So that's our website. And, um, yeah, happy to take questions. Let me bring up my chat, uh, chat thing and see if any questions come up now. Yeah, so get your questions coming in, people. We don't actually have any in here yet. So um, I should have explained this at the beginning. We're going to take questions now. Um, about Karina model while while Heather's still on the line because she does have to run off. So if you've got any questions, please use the chat function or better still use the question and answer function um, and I'll be able to field those and pass them on. While we're waiting, um, I've got a question. Um, you've kind of touched on this, Heather, but what, why, why are you not using crowd, existing crowdfunding websites like 
Well, we, um, I, I agree that our system is a, is a bit too manual to be as good as you want it to be. So there's a little bit of um, behind the scenes. We've done fairly well uh, building that thermometer in WordPress and, and getting it working, but Margaret does spend uh, far too much time checking the bank account and putting the new donors up on that every time. Uh, but the, the thermometer itself adjusts automatically to do with the WordPress settings. But it's all about cost. We didn't feel that we could go back to our donors and say, we're spending all your money directly on projects if the reality was that we were letting a crowdfunding site take 2% or 4%. And there are a number of good crowdfunding sites um, who... Uh, actually have some philanthropists as part of the site. So the idea being that you might uh, get some extra donations from people you wouldn't normally get from if you use their site. Uh, but apart from that, a lot of them, it, it's the, the percentage take that puts us off. Now, we do have a question, who owns the project at the end? Um, and who is, oh, I don't know the second question there, Lynn, so you might retype that. But um, the... Project proponent, uh, the community organisation owns the project from day one. They just have an outstanding debt to us. And so when they've paid us back after five or six years, they make all the savings themselves. So as I, as I explained, we set these projects up so that they see a saving on their electricity bill from day one, even after they've done the repaid loan. But... Um, if I give the example of Gawler Community House, uh, uh, they paid their uh, loan off in a hurry in about four years, and they're now they're now a thousand dollars a year richer because their electricity bills are down and staying down. Who's responsible for maintenance? So that's the arrangement that the community organisation has with their uh, installer. So they'll get a warranty, obviously, but at the end of the day, it's their it's their installation and they're responsible for it. In a way, from a community organisation point of view, Karina's point of view, that's been the, a, quite a low risk way for us to operate, to put the, all those responsibilities back on the community organisation. But we do try to add a lot of value in terms of offering our technical expertise into the project and making sure that um, we, we get people started with the best possible project that they, they can have. Cool. Heather, we've got some questions in the Q&A. It's like a separate chat function here. So I'll, I'll read a couple to you. What size project is most ideal and what size in PV, so size in PV and also in dollars? Um, so uh, ideal is around how much you can self-consume. And, of course, a lot of places don't know how much energy they use during the day. Uh, so we tend to look at their bills and help them decide. Um, we, uh, we had someone who wanted to put 10 kilowatts on and we had to go back to them and say, look, you know, six kilowatts is going to pay for itself, but you have too many times of the day when you're not going to use that power and that solar energy is just going to go out to the grid. Now, that's getting more and more cost effective if your solar energy is going out to the grid because some of the retailers are offering you $0.09, cents, $0.12 cents for that surplus. And for a long time, it's been worth um, nearly nothing. But um, that's all part of the project analysis in terms of how much. We've done a couple of projects that were loans for just energy efficiency projects. So we did a $20,000 project um, with the hospital in Yakandanda. And uh, we've, we've seen some that um, are longer time frames, six, seven year paybacks. Right. Uh, so, so that's, so, that's about right for us. So, so it's kind of like, it's not, it, it really depends on the savings, the size it depends on savings. Um, my other question is done. Um, who, who, who make, I'm going to sort of try and answer a couple of questions by asking you a sort of hybrid question here. Who, who makes good, good host sites for you? So there's a question here that asks about um, council owning facilities um, that are long-term leases to childcare centres. Have you done any of those? Would they qualify? We, we did a Montessori uh, school and we've done a childcare here in South Australia. They're excellent. They've got air conditioning all day long. 
Um, you know, they've got lots of consumption and when the temperature go up, goes up and the sun is shining brightly, their consumption's going up as well. So yeah. those sort of heavily um, used buildings are great. We're getting quite a trickle of community buildings where uh, they booked out occasionally during the evening and so it's harder to make a project fit uh, for a community building and a sporting group because their consumption will mostly be in the evening and at night, yeah. not in the day um, when the, the sun shines. But as I say, I think that market's changing a little bit and we just need to keep an eye on it. You know, there will be a time when we can justify those projects. Great. Okay. So we've got a few questions. We'll have to speed up the answers a little bit. Do you have any examples of loan documentation on your website that could be replicated and maybe expand the expand the question in your own mind when you answer it, Heather? No, it's not on the website, but we're happy to share it. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm gonna, there's, there's a question from Cheryl I'm going to ask leave to last. So bear with me, Cheryl. Um, do you do energy use behavior programs? How do you, how do you make sure that the host sites are getting the most of from from energy efficiency from a behavioural change perspective? No, um, and this will depend on who has introduced us to the site. So we've um, tried to promote it through second parties. Some of our best members are members who care about these organisations and have really helped them put the project together and talk to them about the energy efficiency and the behaviour change. But um, because we're operating mainly from Adelaide, and we've got sites all over the country, we're reliant on our local members uh, to help that. Okay, great. I think we're gonna to have to move on. So there's a couple of questions that haven't been answered, but perhaps I could ask you, Heather, if you could open up the Q&A uh, session and, and try and answer those by text. Last question I want you to answer live is, um, you seem to be a volunteer organisation. What time commitments are required to successfully operate and, and are any of your funds used to cover staffing payments and operational? Costs. No, uh, in our ideal world, we uh, improve our model to be able to pay for some staff time and some of that would go on marketing, for example, um, because we think that's a virtuous cycle. We'd be able to earn more money, uh, grow our revolving fund and, um, and pay someone to do it at the same time. But uh, it, we're very lucky that Margaret Hender has... Um, almost done this as a full-time job for um, three or four years. So it's not uh, trivial how much volunteer time this is soaked up. Yeah, and it's, that's not an uncommon story across all the different types of small-scale solar projects that are, are out there. A lot of them are hiding a huge volunteer effort behind them, um, which is wonderful, but you know, a lot of those groups also thinking about how they can solve that into the longer term. Are you okay to try and answer a couple of those questions? I will answer them live. You're welcome to turn me off. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks for and, joining um, us, Heather. That's great. Look forward to hearing from Chris. Okay, thanks. Cool. So we're going to now introduce Chris Weir from Bendigo Sustainability Group. Um, Bendigo Sustainability Group have been taking a, a highly adaptive approach and what we're calling a multi-model um, uh, method of... Um, really bringing together a range of different funding options, a range of different um, purchase agreements with their, with their customers. Um, Chris, can you introduce yourself and we'll get started with your presentation. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, hi, everybody. It's Chris Weir from the Bendigo Sustainability Group. Um, we're a very active group in, the, in our community and region. Um, so we're in central Victoria. Um, and we've been on this pathway for about four and a half years, five years now. Um, and as we step through the slides, um, sorry, Tom, it looks like you might have to take it. Sorry about that. Try now. Um, so quick definition, what's, a, you know, what's community energy? It's when a group gets together and develops uh, and operates uh, and benefits from setting up a, an energy project or efficiency uh, energy efficiency uh, initiative. Um, Not working? No. No, just say next when you're ready and I'll click okay. through for you, sorry. Um, so basically there's a, a, a process that we talk about and we've evolved over a period of time uh, and I'll be talking about that as we work through this presentation. So why do we do it? We want to keep local ownership and decision making and generate um, local jobs 
We want to develop resources and use them efficiently and sustainable. We want to keep the energy um, um, dollars in our local community. So we've mapped, we think there's about $150 million goes out in energy costs out of the Bendigo um, city and goes to the retailers and the distributors and the generators. And predominantly, a lot of them are actually overseas. So we're really keen to make sure we can keep the, um, keep the dollars here in Bendigo as much as we can, that we can do sustainable um, projects and ongoing. And of course, help address climate change. Next. So, um, so what we try and do is what I recommend to people is if you're going to put a team together, look for a project and I'll talk about sizing in a minute. Basically you need a project manager. So somebody who's skilled in facilitating teams, who's probably got a good understanding, a bit of technical, a bit of financial, a bit of comms. Um, so the project manager is usually the person that we have who would um, keep an eye on the team and on the facilities and on the process. Um, so he's the chief wrangler, so we say. The technical person can usually be somebody with some sort of uh, electrical background or building background um, to advise and, and look at quotes, uh, look at uh, some of the technology that we need to deal with. Um, it's not a high skill set that we're looking for, um, but certainly somebody who's got interest in um, electricity helps. Uh, the next person is a financial person, so definitely um, trying to help get um, the, the financial modelling right. We put together our spreadsheets and then follow through on the billing process. So certainly the comms and the engagements, that's a really important uh, scope of work and you'll hear a little bit more later on in the project. Thanks, Tom. So in terms of the preliminary feasibility, so you've heard Heather um, talk about that. So we go hard ourselves. We actually have a core team that I've just mentioned and we get involved in talking or scoping out potential buildings and we get to try and talk with the local owner. So in our case, we've been very lucky um, that all our projects to date have involved the council. So where the council actually own the building and operate the building on behalf of, for instance, the kindergarten or themselves. Um, so you'll see uh, the first project we kicked off was a library. And then uh, the last one we've done is their archive center. Um, so we, we sort of try and determine, we ask the question, like Heather mentioned, who's the owner, who's the operator, who owns the roof, and who's gonna pay the power bill. We then ask and say, can we have a look at your power bill, please? Um, we wanna see your tariff. So up to date, um, some of these tariffs have been quite low. Um, so if they're part of a big government buy or a big corporation, they might be paying, in, in the case in Victoria here, they may be paying 15 cents a kilowatt. Um, and that's a bit low for us to make a, a, um, a project out of it. Um, but we're just about to be hit with up to 20 to 30% uh, price increase. And then suddenly this makes it really worthwhile. So, and, and also there's another level, which is what they call demand. Uh, you pay excess for demand, uh, excess demand, and that takes the bill up. Um, so we want to clarify what's the existing power supply contract, who's your retailer, um, and we want to know about that because we can um, look around and understand. Because not all the time are we providing 100% of the power. In some cases, it might be only 10%, it might be 30%, it might be 50 but it's unusual. We would never usually do 100%. So with the behind the meter, um, we usually uh, will only do up to something like 50-60%. Um, the next thing we just need to know about the metering is that it's single phase or triple phase, um, and that's a question in regards to how we handle the installation. Um, one of the things that we're really keen to know is about the roof. What sort of roof is it? What's the direction? Is it facing north? Has it got easy access? Because one of the costs may be having to get in lifters or uh, cranes to bring panels on top so that can um, uh, up the price. What sort of roof? Is it an old tile roof or is it a metal roof? Um, has it got hairy overlay? So that's the sort of thing we kind of need to know about too. From that, we use a program called Nearmap. It's a commercial um, uh, product. And what we do is we uh, nominate the building. So we zoom in, have a look at it. And what that actually does is give us the capacity to 
place um, a number of panels or we look at the number of panels that we put on the roof and very quickly we can determine whether that's a 10 kilowatt or a 20 or 30 or 50 kilowatt that we can possibly put on the roof. So that starts to reflect um, our cost of our investment. So we use that program called NearMap. It's a subscription system um, and we found that really, really good. And what that does is enables us to actually work out a really good scope that when we take it uh, to different installers so we can get the best price. We don't, we don't use one installer, we shop it around with commercial installers. So we use the near map to work out our investment and our technical. Thanks, Tom. Great. I'll just bring all the points up because I was struggling to keep the right pace there. there you go. So some of the other things we look at is, you know, what's our return on investment? Um, we use another program called the ATA Sunulator. Um, have you talked about that, Tom, in the past? Yeah. No, but yeah, be, be aware that it's a great free assessment tool. Yeah. Um, so it has a bit to do with what the amount of sunlight we think we can get on a particular roof. Um, so is the sun going to come up and hit the panels early in the morning and go down later in the afternoon? Or is it going to come up later in the morning and go down later in the afternoon? So it depends whether it's north or east or west facing. Um, we also run it through uh, some financial modelling. Uh, one of those is the frontier impact modelling, um, but we've also got our own uh, calculator that we use. Um, just be aware um, there is an issue with cap, uh, in GST. So sometimes the, cap, the uh, guys put up a price excluding GST, um, but you, you may or may not need to build that into your project. So especially if you're operating in, say, a non-for-profit there may be an impact of GST. Um, so we own the panels, we, we raise the funds, we install the panels and we put the roof, uh, put them on the roof. Um, our insurance issue is that we basically only cover the panels uh, for possible hail but in terms of uh, on the roof we do ask the roof host to put the panels in under their insurance. So if the building had a fire or uh, um, it collapsed or there was theft, not, it's hard to do theft, but um, it would be covered under their building insurance. We do use a lot of internet connecting because we're looking at the, um, uh, at the inverter uh, and I'll talk about that a bit far. So we really want to know about internet connection so we ask, see if we can get Wi-Fi or uh, Internet Connect. So we then prepare, having done all that, we then prepare and present a preliminary proposal to the roof host or the client who's going to fund it. And that takes us to stage two. So what's oh, this sorry. image? Yeah, so this is the image from NearMap. This is actually a winery up in the Yarra Valley. And what we've been able to do is zoom in and uh, in uh, augmented reality or virtual reality, place the panels on the roof to get some idea. So we're looking at shadowing. So you can see on that, at that roof there, there's a bit of shadowing going on. Um, the near map are a series of flights that are uh, undertaken by uh, an organization. They do it about every three to six months. Um, and we use that to, as I say, build and say, okay, we can put a hundred panels on this roof. Great. Sunulator. So there's the Sunulator uh, calculator. Um, so what you've got is you've got a series of eight pages. It is a bit complex um, and the ATA guys are probably the best to use it. But what you basically do is you plug in um, some certain parameters um, and you can have a look at, well, what happens if we put 20 kilowatts or 40 kilowatts, 60 kilowatts and what's our return on our investment? What's the self-consumption? Um, so it is a bit technical, but it really helps us to get a very clear uh, image as to what the return on investment and what the technical feasibility. Mm -hmm. Great. I say, so the client, so we put a proposition to the client and typically the deals we're doing now is that we're doing a 10 year deal. So they'll enter into a power purchase agreement and there's two pathways here. We either do a fixed rate for the next 10 years or we say to them, Hey, would you like to match it against what they're paying? Um, uh, on the other 50% or 30% that they're bringing in out of the grid. And to date, some of them have said that, thinking that the price is going down, but in actual fact, the price goes up. So um, we're, we're a bit of a winner on that. 
We also, in our contracts, put a, a uh, and we're a bit cheeky about that, we put in a function for CPI. So we load it up against the national CPI increase and um, we get a usually about 25 to 3% um, increase over the price. So as I said, we, we look at a 10-year deal and the idea is um, we will hand the panels back or gift the panels back to the client after 10 years and they've got another potential 15 years if not longer um, for that so they'll have free energy from year 10 onwards um, as all they'll ha might have to be do is replace the inverters the inverters only have a life of 10 years um, so they may have to put in new inverters Um, so what we do is, again, we get a bit of an estimate on the installation. Are there issues with the roof? We check in Victoria, we've got to check with the distributor that there's not too much solar in the street and that we may or may not be restricted to the amount of solar that we can put on. We in Victoria are a bit lucky. We can also request the smart meter data. So we also start to look into, you know, peak usage and off-peak usage. Um, again, we do request and we do get the, arch the ideally the uh, architectural drawings, the engineering drawings and the electrical drawings for the building um, because we just want to see if there's any nasties that uh, may pop up uh, once we start drilling into some of that stuff um, because we don't want to be caught out having to replace the roof because uh, of one of trying to put the panels on the roof. Um, one of the projects we did have to engage with the council over the historical overlay. So it's an issue to be aware of and, and load into your calculation. Thanks, John. So preliminary re regal, legals. So there's only really two basic legals. So we do the crowdfunding or we do, um, we use a revolving energy fund. So basically we use a power purchase agreement and it currently runs about uh, 10, 12 pages and it has a schedule at the back so basically who, who's involved, who the agreement is, what are the rates, what's the duration and how you're going to deal with end of life. And then a second agreement is the roof rental. So the idea is whoever is hosting the panels on the roof, we come to some agreement that we have the right of access to be able to get up on the roof, remove the panels should there be a dispute or, a, you know, you wouldn't want to do it, but just in case there is. Um, if we want a free right of access, that is part of the roof rental agreement. And the two documents took, uh, cross over and talk to each other. But it might be that the power purchase agreement is with somebody else, say, for instance, inside the building, but the roof rental agreement might be the owner of the building. So they're two separate documents. Hmm. Cool. Whoops. Thanks, Tom. Sorry. Here we go. Okay. So then we work out the funding, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, how, how we're going to fund this project. Um, and Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to use crowdfunding. So we've done crowdfunding, but we've done it ourselves. We didn't put it out with Possible or Go Get or anything like that. Um, we've done donations. We've also tapped into grants. We've also taken on the last project. We took a little small loan because I wanted to test our power purchase agreement with the bank, and they um, uh, accepted that. And so it was a little amount. It was ten thousand dollars. But if I go back to them next time and look for $100,000, and you'll see why later on, then they go, well, we've tested this uh, power purchase agreement. You've been paying the loan off. Uh, you're a good guy. So um, that, that is a hybrid model. And again, I'll talk about that on a particular project. We then are looking at what sort of the vehicle we're going to use. So uh, later on, Tom may talk about the special purpose vehicle, Clear Sky um, and uh, Shoalhaven. Um, uh, guys who use the special purpose vehicle. We also may put stuff through um, a, a donations guaranteed, um, so where we can provide people uh, tax concessions if they put it through the G, uh, the organisation that has DGR status. We may do it as a company, we may do it as an incorporated organisation, we're a, an incorporated association ourselves, or you may do it as a co-op. We set dates and targets, and then we undertake a fairly extensive risk assessment. So we're having a look at the technical feasibility, the um, what is the issues, uh, what are the technical issues, is it a high wind area, are the panels likely to blow off the roof, how secure they are. So we undertake that risk assessment ourselves. 
and we work with the council to run through that risk assessment. It's a really important thing. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Um, having done all that, we prepare tender documents. So we actually put it out to tender. We only use uh, commercial grade installers. So we've, we've got to know and identify the most experienced commercial installers around. Um, with that tender document, it's quite comprehensive. It runs about 10 pages now. Um, and therefore we have a very extensive um, selection criteria and weighting program to that. Um, so for instance, um, you know, we've got to live in the town and work with these guys. So it's just not about price. It, you know, the price is one small element, you know, um, do they comply with the OH and S regulations? Do they meet all the electrical regulations? Um, we also drill in and what's the terms and conditions of the contract. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, what we do is that they don't get full payment until we've had the system actually running for a month. And we look and interrogate the inverter and we've got another monitoring system. So if they've said, oh, look, you're going to put 20 kilowatts on the roof and on an average day you're going to generate 15 kilowatt um, and we look at the inverter and um, we see that it's only generating 10, then there's an issue with either the panels or the inverter or the installation. So we won't pay them until that's been rectified and it's met specification. Um, in terms of equipment specification, we only look at tier one, um, both in panels and in um, uh, and the inverter. Um, so yes, we can uh, do it a bit cheaper, but we don't think, you know, these projects are going to be around for 10, 20 years. Um, we don't see any reason to cut corners to save a couple of dollars. Then uh, having prepared the contract, so we've now got back pricing from the installer and they've given us a quote. So we now go to the client and say, okay, we've been able to lock down our, our price. Are you now ready to proceed? So they then sign off on the power purchase agreement and off we go on to the next stage. At this point, we start off on the marketing and fundraising. So we set timelines and marketing budgets and um, get our engagement team on board. So we set about with our media plans. Our best um, call to action and response is Facebook. And I'll show you again in this upcoming slide where we go with the Facebook and how we map that out. We're also actively engaged with setting up a PR program. So I've got a couple of people who might, who write media releases and we always do photographs and invite the media, TV and press along to those sessions. Cool, we're gonna to jump to the next slide here, Chris. Thank you. All right, I think this is the video slide next and apologies in advance if there's some equality with the video side of it, but we understand. Yep. It'll run at about five frames per second, but you'll get the gist of the idea. So this was a video that we did. Hi, my name's Karen. Sorry, Chris, do you, do you want to finish what you were saying? Yeah, so we asked Karen Core. So this was our first project. It was on the Bendigo Library and we we're looking for $25,000. Karen Core is somebody in the, in the, you know, is an influencer in our community. And what we did is put this video up and then we put it on our website, we put it up on Facebook and it's basically a call out to be a participant. One of the things you'll see in this, we decide rather than looking for just small donations, your 10 or a five, we said we were looking for 80 uh, people to donate $400 to get um, 80 panels. We were able to fulfill this project within two and a half months. And it was because we approached um, local businesses, uh, a lot of families got involved, and so we were able to reach that commitment. So for some people to go to donation models and they go, well, we accept any money they, you know, they struggle with the five and the ten dollars. Um, so we we kind of go the other way. We took a bit bit of a punt and we um, asked for uh, four hundred dollars. Right. Thanks, Tom. Cora, and I'm a member of the Bendigo Sustainability Group. I'm here to tell you about an exciting community project that you can come on board and be a part of. The Bendigo Sustainability Group has secured the rights to install eighty solar panels on the Bendigo Goldfields Library. The City of Greater Bendigo will then pay us the commercial rates for the electricity generated and used in the library. This system will generate approximately 10% of the library's total usage. The contract is for the next 20 years. 
The income generated by the solar will be used by the BSG for other community sustainability projects. We are looking to install 80 panels on the library roof. Each panel is valued at $400, including installation. So we are asking you to go to the bsg.org.au site and click onto the donations page and enter your details. Thanks so much for being involved and being part of our community owned solar project. Fabulous. So here's what we did. So we set up with our web developer. Um, we had a direct donation that went straight into our bank. The reason we did that is with any of those other groups, they do take 5% of, of the funds that are raised or 7.5%. And in some case, some of, the some of those um, guys also, if you don't reach budget, they you know, um, download and refund the money back to the people. So we just found it was easy if we did our own direct cash donation. We didn't have any problems and it just worked really well. And you can see down there, um, we'd set up a fund, the Sustained Bendigo Fund, that actually had um, tax, uh, income tax exempts, uh, sorry, uh, deductible gift uh, status. Um, this is becoming harder for organisations to get that status um, but, um, because of some political issues, um, but we found that works quite well. Thanks, Tom. How are we doing for time there, Chris? I note that it's just gone past I'm, 7 o'clock. Yeah, I'll, I'll belt through the rest of it very quickly. Fabulous. And um, people, please start getting your questions in if, if, if you want to have some questions answered at the end. Um, so one of the biggest things is, is the Facebook. So every time somebody donated, we rushed out with a camera and took a photo. And what happened is that they distributed on their um, uh, Facebook um, site. And we actually uh, reached a lot of people. So our Facebook, uh, Facebook like engagement program I think we jumped up to two or 3,000 people. It, it just, um, because the people that took the photo or the people that were in the photo, they distributed amongst their group. So it just worked really well. That's Thanks, great. Tom. Yeah. Um, so here's some of the PR, you know, we'd be writing um, stories in the newspaper, having photos. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Um, then we got project sign off. So we got the money and we commissioned the project. Thanks. Um, we signed the contracts, paid the deposit, worked the timetable. We did follow through. Just be aware that there are quite a lot of technical, with commercial sites, you've got to have your material safety data sheets, your SWIMS and your HC, uh, your health safety environments. We're real sticklers for this because if anybody falls off the roof, um, that's going to be a real big drama. Mm -hmm. uh, having done that, we install our own monitoring gear and I'll, I'll show that a bit later but we also get final as built plans. So you can probably guess the fact that I've been involved in lots of big projects and we're applying this project management skill set to this. Um, we also sign off on the uh, small scale technical certificates and we only award or pay the five payment and get the worries and ownership when we verify the operation over 30 days, up to 30 days of operation. Um, here in the library, we've actually got a um, monitoring of the solar on the site. So as, as everybody walks through the library, they can actually see what's happening with their investment and the community's investment in the solar on the roof. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a, a photo of the um, output. Um, so this is from the inverter itself. And you can see, um, so we make this a community dashboard. So there is a number of people that can drill in. So because this has been uh, the, the income is coming from the council. Um, we are able to give them access to this data, but we also present it back into our community. Um, and one of the really interesting things is that it's also mapping the weather. So if the usage is down, it may be because it's a rainy day and it won't set off alarms. Great. And there's another, another system on the next slide, right? What's this? Correct. One? Yeah. So this is the solar analytics. One of the good things about solar analytics stuff is that we're getting ready for mapping solar and interfacing with battery. So it may be that we might end up putting more solar on the roof to be able to connect it with batteries. Our thinking is batteries are a little bit early at this point in time, but it will be coming fast. So um, batteries are, you know, and, and that um, monitoring is really important. And again, that particular unit is a billable grade monitoring system. And that's what we use to do our billing and invoice the council from. 
I think we're done, Chris. So well I think done. We're done. Yep. Yeah. Let's um let's get the questions in and we'll try and wrap questions up in just a few minutes because we have gone over time. But I noticed that we've still got pretty much everyone still on the line. So that's great. I will kick off with my first question. Um, this is really interesting the way you've got this roof rental agreement, which is separate to the power purchase agreement. It, it, it assumes that it may not be the landlord that is the occupant. Who, who's, who have you tended to be entering into with the, host, host, the roof rental agreement? Yeah, so um, what we didn't show on the slide, uh, this, this, sorry, one of the missing slides here is that we've done four projects today. So they've averaged in size from um, 10 kilowatts or 11 kilowatts all, uh, all the way up to 50 kilowatts. Um, and in most cases, it's the council. So the council provide the building or the roof. And for instance, the library is paid by the council via the library or the archive centre is paid by the council via the historical society. Um, so we just find it easy to make sure that we've got a separate roof rental agreement as we move um, into commercial space. So um, particularly in other spaces, we might do a deal with the local shopping centre, for instance. Uh, um, but the shopping centre is actually owned by a superannuation fund. Um, but the electricity is being consumed by the grocery shop. Um, there's no questions coming through. I sense people perhaps uh, smelling their dinner and keen to get to that. Um, I'm going to ask a couple, so people are probably going to hate me for this, but I'll, I'll go through, go there anyway. Um, it sounds like the whole process has been a, it sounds like the whole process is, is, is a process of gradually building confidence that the host site is actually going to be a viable host site. Can you, can you talk to that a little bit? Uh, well, we wouldn't go there and, you know, from our research and analysis and, 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 it's, and I'm sorry, it does appear to be complex, but um, it, it's evolved over a period of time. So the first project took two and a half years, nearly three years for us to gain the trust and with the council. Um, uh, we had to go and get uh, approvals from essential services here in Victoria. Um, we also had to go through uh, the, the council municipal um, uh, government authorities. But we are now able to turn these projects around in somewhere between three and four months. Between We've now refined our process and we've now got our financial engine sorted out so we can now go at speed. And in actual fact, we're just in the process of mapping all the potential commercial roof sites in Bendigo and we're going to start to go around and start to go and talk to those people. And yeah. having said that, we're also talking to Castlemaine, Echuca, um, and up into the to the uh, northwest corner. So these are communities in your sort of regional proximity. Yeah, that's great. Right. Um, and, and I guess what I was trying to get to there is, y yes, there's a lot of steps in your process, but you, what you're doing, obviously, is you're eliminating, weeding out the projects at the earliest possible stage that are not going to be viable, putting the least amount of effort in. Correct. Determine they're not going to work. Correct. Before, yeah. yeah. Um, the question here from Gavin seems risky to have a volunteer group doing the metering and billing. Other groups delegate this to the supplier. Yeah, that's right. So Clear Sky, for instance, do that. Um, but we have um, built up our expertise in being able to do this. Um, it's actually not that hard because of um, the work we've done in selecting the monitoring gear. We only do it every three months. We go in and compare what's what it was last quarter and what it's been used and then we just apply our rates to it. So, um, uh, yeah, it's not a big drama. Um, I can see what's the RO, the return on investment. So we've actually got a revolving energy fund. So we look to get profit and then we go and take that money and we now are about to roll out another project worth $15,000 for 15 kilowatts. Um, and we're using that money that's now coming in from those sites. So we definitely look at that. And the reason we've done the ROI is that we will be looking at some of these commercial sites and we are likely to go and get money from um, um, investors. So we'll be looking to get somewhere between uh, 6 and 7% return on investment, which is quite good. So Clear Sky, that's what they do. They get investors who come in and then they pitch um, and win the project, and then they get a they they work out an arrangement over ten years, um, and they get a return on investment. Um, do you have to seek donations for each system, or does the revolving fund pay? Uh, and we'll try and answer the other two questions if we're quick here, Chris. Yeah. Um, so very quickly, um, uh, we're at a point we we don't necessarily need the donation, 
uh, because we've got this revolving energy fund now. Um, but in actual fact, I do want to go back and engage with the community. So I do want to do a couple of small projects and particularly community projects, which might be like the, um, a, a kindergarten preschool where it has local you know, people in the, using that space would be involved in that project. Um, so we do uh, starting to use, sorry, do a couple of projects. So we're using a hybrid. So we've got some projects which are small and are suitable for donation. And then the larger ones, that's where we start to do a, more of a commercial um, influence on it. Cool. Uh, you're, you've spent a lot of time developing these tools. Are these available for other community groups? Uh, yes. And, and, and my hesitation lies is that, that you, we, we kind of need to set up and do training. So um, I can give you all the tools, but really um, what I found in the process is training. So um, with the C4CE guys, we've been looking and talking about running training sessions, particularly in Victoria but I've also done some sessions in, up in New South Wales. Um, so they tend to be a kind of a one day workshop, getting people involved and giving them the skill sets um, because some of it is a, a little bit complex, but you need a bit of a hands-on experience. So, Okay. Chris, thank you very much for your time tonight and thank you to Heather in, in absence um, for, for, for your contribution as well, Heather. That's wonderful. Um, thank you to everybody who joined us. Uh, I see you stuck it out even though we ran over time and that's great. We'll put this up on the, um, on the website as soon as possible and we'll email you all around and, and promote the fact that the recording's out there. So as always, tell everybody you know about this. Um, and yeah, next week it's going to be um, investment investment models. So very similar to what we've done tonight, but looking at the some of the investment models. Thank you, everybody.